Now, I give a definition of consciousness, something which eludes some of the greatest philosophical works, I think. I read a number of treaties on consciousness, and they never define it. I give a definition in one sentence, and that is, consciousness is the process of creating multiple feedback loops to create a model of yourself in space with regards to others and in time in order to satisfy certain goals. Alligators, for example, would be at stage one. At level one, they understand their position in space with regards to prey. The back of our brain, for example, is the most ancient part of our brain, the reptilian brain. The uh, No, way in the back of the brain, the medulla, the cerebellum, oh, yeah. balance, for example, in a car accident. You would sustain injury here, your sense of balance is thrown out, territoriality, hunger. Then the center part of the brain develops when you're an adolescent. That's the monkey brain, the, the brain of social hierarchies. That's when children have to learn politeness. That's when they have to learn social etiquette and the social hierarchy and control their emotions. And then the last part of the brain to develop is the front, the prefrontal cortex, and that is the thinking brain, and that di differentiates us from the animals. Animals have level one consciousness, they understand their position in space. Monkeys have level two, that is, they understand their relationship to other monkeys. But only humans have level three consciousness, which is understanding tomorrow, the future. We daydream, we scheme, we plan. Animals don't do that. It's all instinctual for animals. And then a scientist says, well, this scale is very nice, but what is your unit? Your unit of consciousness. My one unit of consciousness is the thermostat. One feedback loop that allows you to monitor the temperature in a room, because it senses its position with regards to temperature. A flower may have 10 or so, because it has to monitor temperature, humidity, water, sunlight, so on and so forth. And then by the time you hit a reptile, maybe 100 different kinds of feedback loops. By the time you go to a mouse, perhaps thousands of feedback loops. And then we, as humans, we're the only ones who see tomorrow. If you have a pet, like a dog or a cat, you can teach it many tricks except understanding tomorrow. So then, where would you put numerically our consciousness? And well, how we exactly be... do you get to that number? Because you're talking about measuring consciousness and you mentioned those 20,000 papers. Most of them, or many of them say you cannot really measure consciousness. You cannot even identify, some of them say, the brain structure that it's associated with. Arguably. What would you want to say about that? I think we can rank up the scale and measure the consciousness of anything, even robots, even extraterrestrial intelligence, um, animals, dogs, cats, and pets, on the number of feedback loops. Mm -hmm. For example, a thermostat would have one unit, a flower would have 10 units, but think of a crocodile. Crocodile, crocodile has multiple feedback loops because it has to understand its position in space and then its prey, understand the behavior of the prey. And by the time you go to monkeys, it's even much larger. Monkeys have to understand emotions. They have to read body language. They have to understand their position in a social hierarchy, coalitions, who's your friend, who's your enemy. Things that are very, very complex are involved in monkeys. And by the time you reach a human, the total number of feedback loops involved in predicting the future is enormous. Yeah, I understand that, but my concern here is that we kept kind of a relative scale. So human relative to a monkey, monkey relative to alligator, alligator relative to a flower. Right. But do we get an absolute measurement? Because, I mean, isn't that what science is all about? Is to have a mathematically precise exact number in the end of the day. Right. So in other words, I would give a test to a human to rank their level of consciousness. It's not an IQ exam. That's the first thing you think of an IQ exam. Mm -hmm. But when you follow people with high IQs over 20, 30 years, you find a lot of marginal people petty criminals, people on the margins of society. IQ tests do not strongly correlate with success in life. However, there is Maybe one characteristic. Criminals. However, when you look at a criminal, yeah. you realize that safe crackers, even though they may have low IQs because they flunked grade school, they may understand the future of a bank robbery much better than the police. Exactly. They can outwit the police because they can dream up scenarios yeah. more realistically than the police can. So here's my, quote, IQ test, and that is to put people in strange environments and have them calculate realistic scenarios. Now, the Air Force understood this. Long time ago, the Air Force gave IQ exams and found that they were not very useful for understanding how good pilots are in war. They gave them another test. 
Let's say you're stranded behind enemy lines. Calculate the total number of escape plans that you can devise. And they found that people who have, quote, low IQs were very good at seeing the future. And people with high IQs did not necessarily see many escape plans like the others. And that's what I'm saying. The number of realistic scenarios you can compute for a given situation, being stranded on an island, mm -hmm. or being stranded behind enemy lines, robbing a bank, that correlates to me much better with our level of consciousness than an IQ exam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, all of this is measurable. We can put this on a scale, including robots. If yeah. my scale is correct, then even robots can be ranked by consciousness. I would say that robots are at level one. They understand their position in space. They have the intelligence of a cockroach. Yeah. Asimo, one of the most world's advanced robots, I interviewed the, the creator of Asimo, and he admitted that, yeah, Asimo has insect-like intelligence. That's an exact quote from the developer of one of the most advanced robots on the planet Earth. Now at MIT, they're trying to develop some emotional robots. That would be the beginning of level two, and maybe even a little bit of level three, because robots can predict the future in one dimension. They can predict, for example, airflow on an airplane wing, but that's about it. Yeah. We can predict the future in multiple scales. Throw somebody on a deserted island, let them survive, put them behind enemy lines. All of a sudden you realize that you have to have a full complex of common sense notions about space, time, and other people in order to escape behind enemy lines. For now, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the brain on the one hand and consciousness? How does it arise in the brain? Where exactly? And how does that whole process work? Well, historically, we had something called dualism, where the Descartes. spirit, the soul, was different from the body. Then in the last 50 years, we had a little bit of neuroscience, where we began to realize that the brain is wetware. Wetware that runs software called the mind. So we began a unified theory so that the mind is software running on the wetware of the brain. But now, we have the next level of evolution, and that is the connectome. President Barack Obama and the European Union want to dump, dump a billion dollars to create the connectome, a map of all the neural circuitry of the human mind. So one day we'll have two disks. We'll have a genome and a connectome. One which has a map of the genes of our body, and the other one all the neural pathways of the mind which contains emotions, memories, sensations. And in some sense, we're going back hundreds of years into the past. We are now separating the body from the mind by having the genome and the connectome. Mm -hmm. And realize that when you die, in some sense, the connectome and the genome live on. And of course, is this, does that mean that you are immortal? Well, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it depends on how you define you. <laughs> if you are nothing but wetware running software, then when you die, hey, that's it, sorry about that, folks, you're gone. But if your connectome and your genome survive, in some sense, a part of you live forever. Tell us a little bit more about um, what your take is on, for example, the hammer of Penrose's theory of quantum consciousness. Well, Penrose, of course, is a very well-known, well-established physicist at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. I think he's onto something, but perhaps there's less than meets the eye. First of all, the question is, is a computer deterministic? That is, once you push the button, the outcome is known perfectly? The answer is yes. A computer is nothing but a bunch of transistors. You push the on button and you get an output. Then the question is, is the human brain deterministic? Exactly. Are we programmed or do we have free will? Exactly. And that goes to the whole question of philosophy, religion. Are you responsible if you are a mass murderer? Why do we put people in jail? Why do we punish people? Our entire society rests on the question of free will. If we are a bunch of transistors, then there is no free will. So in some sense, I disagree with the hardcore determinists who say that we are nothing but a bunch of transistors masquerading as neurons, uh, that is totally deterministic, that one day we can model with a machine. I think that we do have some degree of free will. However, the free will is different from the free will of Penrose and, and other individuals that have written about the subject. For example, if I have uh, a motion picture of a Hollywood movie, Everything is deterministic. I know the beginning, I know the end. People in the movie could say, I have free will. I am the master of my destiny. But we know we hit the play button. Mm -hmm. And the play button means that everything is scripted, meaning that this conversation is scripted. Yes. That means that the outcome of this conversation is also scripted.
I don't believe in that for several reasons. First of all, there is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yeah. If I have two Earths and create them four and a half billion years ago and then run the play button, four and a half billion years later, if I have twin Earths, will they both evolve humans? And the answer is probably no. Not necessarily. Probably no, because of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So quantum mechanics does play a certain role in the human mind. Now, if you take a look at trying to model a neuron, realize that neurons are leaky. They're messy. They're not digital. They're not just on and off. Sometimes they, are, they leak. They have all sorts of deficiencies. Neurons are not totally deterministic. Mm -hmm. And I think that the narrower a neuron is, the more leakage you get. And these are quantum mechanical effects. So I disagree with Penrose into thinking that that's why we cannot build a robot with human-like intelligence. I believe that we will one day create robots with near human-like intelligence that are indistinguishable from humans passing the Turing test. So I would disagree with my colleague, Roger Penrose. I believe that we will one day have a robot that can pass the Turing test. However, I also believe that there are quantum effects. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are totally deterministic. In the brain, you mean? In the brain. Mm -hmm. Neurons leak. They have quantum mechanical effects that manifest at the ion level because, of course, you had the transport of ions across neurons that, that enable it to fire. Mm -hmm. These are small effects. So for the most part, the, the brain looks deterministic. But I think ultimately there is free will. Ultimately, we are masters of our destiny.